Chapter Twenty Three of the Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Thirty Three: Soubrette and Mistress. Meantime, as we have said, despite the cries of his conscience and the wise counsels of Athos, D'Artagnan became hourly more in love with Milady. Thus he never failed to pay his diurnal court to her, and the self-satisfied Gascon was convinced that sooner or later she could not fail to respond. One day, when he arrived with his head in the air, and as light at heart as a man who awaits a shower of gold, he found the soubrette under the gateway of the hotel. But this time the pretty Kitty was not contented with touching him as he passed. She took him gently by the hand. Good, thought D'Artagnan. She is charged with some message for me from her mistress. She is about to appoint some rendezvous of which she had not courage to speak. And he looked down at the pretty girl with the most triumphant air imaginable. "'I wish to say three words to you, Monsieur Chevalier,' stammered the soubrette. "'Speak, my child, speak,' said D'Artagnan. "'I listen.' "'Here? Impossible! That which I have to say is too long, and above all too secret.' "'Well, what is to be done?' "'If Monsieur Chevalier will follow me,' said Kitty, timidly. "'Where you please, my dear child.' come then and kitty who had not let go the hand of d'artagnan led him up a little dark winding staircase and after ascending about fifteen steps opened a door come in here monsieur chevalier said she here we shall be alone and can talk and whose room is this my dear child it is mine monsieur chevalier it communicates with my mistresses by that door but you need not fear she will not hear what we say. She never goes to bed before midnight. D'Artagnan cast a glance around him. The little apartment was charming for its taste and neatness, but in spite of himself his eyes were directed to that door which Kitty said led to Milady's chamber. Kitty guessed what was going on in the mind of the young man, and heaved a deep sigh. "'You love my mistress, then, very dearly, Monsieur Chevalier?' said she. Oh, more than I can say, Kitty, I am mad for her. Kitty breathed a second sigh. Alas, monsieur, said she, that is too bad. What the devil do you see so bad in it? said D'Artagnan. Because, monsieur, replied Kitty, my mistress loves you not at all. Hi, said D'Artagnan, can she have charged you to tell me so? Oh, no, monsieur, but out of the regard I have for you, I have taken the resolution to tell you so. Much obliged, my dear Kitty, but for the intention only, for the information, you must agree, is not likely to be at all agreeable. That is to say, you don't believe what I have told you, is it not so? We have always some difficulty in believing such things, my pretty dear, were it only from self-love then you don't believe me. I confess that unless you deign to give me some proof of what you advance, what do you think of this? Kitty drew a little note from her bosom. For me? said D'Artagnan, seizing the letter. No, for another. For another? Yes. His name, his name! cried D'Artagnan. Read the address. Monsieur El Comte de Ward. The remembrance of the scene at Saint-Germain presented itself to the mind of the presumptuous Gascon. As quick as thought he tore open the letter, in spite of the cry which Kitty uttered on seeing what he was going to do, or rather, what he was doing. "'Oh, good Lord, Monsieur Chevalier,' said she, "'what are you doing?' "'I,' said D'Artagnan, "'nothing,' and he read, "'You have not answered my first note.' Are you indisposed, or have you forgotten the glances you favoured me with at the ball of Madame de Guise? You have an opportunity now, Count. Do not allow it to escape. 
D'Artagnan became very pale. He was wounded in his self-love. He thought it was in his love. "'Poor dear Monsieur D'Artagnan,' said Kitty, in a voice full of compassion, and pressing anew the young man's hand. "'You pity me, little one?' said D'Artagnan. "'Oh, yes, and with all my heart, for I know what it is to be in love.' "'You know what it is to be in love?' said D'Artagnan, looking at her for the first time with much attention. "'Alas, yes!' "'Well, then, instead of pitying me, you would do much better to assist me in avenging myself on your mistress. "'And what sort of revenge would you take?' "'I would triumph over her and supplant my rival.' "'I will never help you in that, Monsieur Chevalier,' said Kitty warmly. "'And why not?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'For two reasons. What ones?' "'The first is that my mistress will never love you.' How do you know that? You have cut her to the heart. I? In what can I have offended her? I, who ever since I have known her, have lived at her feet like a slave. <laughs> Speak, I beg you. I will never confess that but to the man who should read to the bottom of my soul. D'Artagnan looked at Kitty for the second time. The young girl had freshness and beauty which many duchesses would have purchased with their coronets. "'Kitty,' said he, "'I will read to the bottom of your soul whenever you like. Don't let that disturb you.' And he gave her a kiss at which the poor girl became as red as a cherry. "'Oh, no,' said Kitty. "'It is not me you love. It is my mistress you love. You told me so just now.' "'And does that hinder you from letting me know the second reason?' "'The second reason, Monsieur the Chevalier,' replied Kitty, emboldened by the kiss in the first place, and still further by the expression of the eyes of the young man, "'is that in love every one for herself.' Then only D'Artagnan remembered the languishing glances of Kitty, her constantly meeting him in the antechamber, the corridor, or on the stairs— those touches of the hand every time she met him, and her deep sighs. But absorbed by his desire to please the great lady, he had disdained the soubrette. He whose game is the eagle takes no heed of the sparrow. But this time our Gascon saw at a glance all the advantage to be derived from the love which Kitty had just confessed so innocently or so boldly. The interception of letters addressed to the Comte de Ward news on the spot, entrance at all hours into Kitty's chamber, which was contiguous to her mistress's. The perfidious deceiver was, as may plainly be perceived, already sacrificing in intention the poor girl in order to obtain Milady willy-nilly. "'Well,' said he to the young girl, "'are you willing, my dear Kitty, that I should give you a proof of that love which you doubt?' "'What love?' asked the young girl. "'Of that which I am ready to feel toward you?' <laughs> "'And what is that proof?' "'Are you willing that I should this evening pass with you the time I generally spend with your mistress?' "'Oh, yes!' said Kitty, clapping her hands. "'Very willing!' "'Well, then, come here, my dear,' said D'Artagnan, establishing himself in an easy chair. Come, and let me tell you that you are the prettiest soubrette I ever saw. And he did tell her so much, and so well, that the poor girl, who asked nothing better than to believe him, did believe him. Nevertheless, to D'Artagnan's great astonishment, the pretty Kitty defended herself resolutely. Time passes quickly when it is passed in attacks and defences. Midnight sounded, and almost at the same time the bell was rung in Milady's chamber. "'Good God!' cried Kitty. "'There is my mistress calling me. Go! Go directly!' D'Artagnan rose, took his hat, as if it had been his intention to obey, then, opening quickly the door of a large closet instead of that leading to the staircase, he buried himself amid the robes and dressing-gowns of Milady. "'What are you doing?' cried Kitty. D'Artagnan, who had secured the key, 
shut himself up in the closet without reply. "'Well!' cried Milady in a sharp voice, "'are you asleep that you don't answer when I ring?' And D'Artagnan heard the door of communication opened violently. "'Here am I, Milady. here am I,' cried Kitty, springing forward to meet her mistress. Both went into the bedroom, and as the door of communication remained open, D'Artagnan could hear Milady for some time scolding her maid. She was at length appeased, and the conversation turned upon him while Kitty was assisting her mistress. "'Well,' said Milady, "'I have not seen our Gascon this evening.' "'What, Milady?' "'Has he not come?' said Kitty. "'Can he be inconstant before being happy?' "'Oh, no! He must have been prevented by Monsieur de Treville or Monsieur de Cessar. "'I understand my game, Kitty. I have this one safe.' "'What will you do with him, madame?' "'What will I do with him? <laughs> be easy, Kitty. There is something between that man and me that he is quite ignorant of.' He nearly made me lose my credit with his eminence. Oh, I will be revenged. I believed that Madame loved him. I love him? I detest him. An idiot, who held the life of Lord de Winter in his hands and did not kill him, by which I missed three hundred thousand livres income. That's true, said Kitty. Your son was the only heir of his uncle and until his majority you would have had the enjoyment of his fortune. D'Artagnan shuddered to the marrow at hearing this suave creature reproach him, with that sharp voice which she took such pains to conceal in conversation, for not having killed a man whom he had seen load her with kindnesses. "'For all this,' continued Milady, "'I should long ago have revenged myself on him if, and I don't know why, the cardinal had not requested me to conciliate him. Oh, yes, but madame has not conciliated that little woman he was so fond of. What, the mercer's wife of the Rue des Fossoyeurs? Has he not already forgotten she ever existed? Fine vengeance, that, on my faith! A cold sweat broke from D'Artagnan's brow. Why, this woman was a monster! He resumed his listening, but unfortunately the toilet was finished. "'That will do,' said Milady. "'Go into your own room, and to-morrow endeavour again to get me an answer to the letter I gave you.' "'For Monsieur de Ward?' said Kitty. "'To be sure, for Monsieur de Ward.' "'Now, there is one,' said Kitty, "'who appears to me quite a different sort of a man from that poor Monsieur d'Artagnan.' "'Go to bed, mademoiselle,' said Milady. "'I don't like comments.' D'Artagnan heard the door close, then the noise of two bolts by which Milady fastened herself in. On her side, but softly as possible, Kitty turned the key of the lock, and then D'Artagnan opened the closet door. "'Oh, good Lord!' said Kitty, in a low voice. "'What is the matter with you? How pale you are!' "'The abominable creature!' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Silence! Silence! Be gone!' said Kitty. "'There is nothing but a wainscot between my chamber and Milady's. Every word that is uttered in one can be heard in the other.' "'That's exactly the reason I won't go,' said D'Artagnan. "'What?' said Kitty, blushing. "'Or, at least, I will go, later.' He drew Kitty to him. She had the less motive to resist. Resistance would make so much noise. Therefore Kitty surrendered. It was a moment of vengeance upon Milady. D'Artagnan believed it right to say that vengeance is the pleasure of the gods. With a little more heart he might have been contented with this new conquest. But the principal features of his character were ambition and pride. It must, however, be confessed in his justification that the first use he made of his influence over Kitty was to try and find out what had become of Madame Bonacieux. But the poor girl swore upon the crucifix to D'Artagnan that she was entirely ignorant on that head, her mistress never admitting her into half her secrets, only she believed she could say she was not dead. 
As to the cause which was near making Milady lose her credit with the cardinal, Kitty knew nothing about it. But this time D'Artagnan was better informed than she was. As he had seen Milady on board a vessel at the moment he was leaving England, he suspected that it was, almost without a doubt, on account of the diamond studs. But what was clearest in all this was that the true hatred, the profound hatred, the inveterate hatred of Milady, was increased by his not having killed her brother-in-law. D'Artagnan came the next day to Milady's, and finding her in a very ill humour, had no doubt that it was lack of an answer from M. de Ward that provoked her thus. Kitty came in, but Milady was very cross with her. The poor girl ventured a glance at D'Artagnan, which said, "'See how I suffer on your account?' Toward the end of the evening, however, the beautiful lioness became milder. She smilingly listened to the soft speeches of D'Artagnan, and even gave him her hand to kiss. D'Artagnan departed, scarcely knowing what to think, but as he was a youth who did not easily lose his head, while continuing to pay his court to Milady, he had framed a little plan in his mind. He found Kitty at the gate, and, as on the preceding evening, went up to her chamber. Kitty had been accused of negligence and severely scolded. Milady could not at all comprehend the silence of the Comte de Ward, and she ordered Kitty to come at nine o'clock in the morning to take a third letter. D'Artagnan made Kitty promise to bring him that letter on the following morning. The poor girl promised all her lover desired. She was mad. Things passed as on the night before. D'Artagnan concealed himself in his closet. Milady called, undressed, sent away Kitty, and shut the door. As the night before, D'Artagnan did not return home till five o'clock in the morning. At eleven o'clock Kitty came to him. She held in her hand a fresh billet from Milady. This time the poor girl did not even argue with D'Artagnan. She gave it to him at once. She belonged body and soul to her handsome soldier. D'Artagnan opened the letter and read as follows. This is the third time I have written to you to tell you that I love you. Beware that I do not write to you a fourth time to tell you that I detest you. If you repent of the manner in which you have acted toward me, the young girl who brings you this will tell you how a man of spirit may obtain his pardon. D'Artagnan colored and grew pale several times in reading this billet. Oh, you love her still, said Kitty, who had not taken her eyes off the young man's countenance for an instant. No, Kitty, you are mistaken. I do not love her, but I will avenge myself for her contempt. Oh, yes, I know what sort of vengeance. You told me that. What matters it to you, Kitty? You know it is you alone whom I love. How can I know that? By the scorn I will throw upon her. D'Artagnan took a pen and wrote, Madame. Until the present moment I could not believe that it was to me your first two letters were addressed. So unworthy did I feel myself of such an honour. Besides, I was so seriously indisposed that I could not in any case have replied to them. But now I am forced to believe in the excess of your kindness, since not only your letter but your servant assures me that I have the good fortune to be beloved by you." She has no occasion to teach me the way in which a man of spirit may obtain his pardon. I will come and ask mine at eleven o'clock this evening. To delay it a single day would be in my eyes now to commit a fresh offence. From him whom you have rendered the happiest of men, Comte de Ward. This note was in the first place a forgery. It was likewise an indelicacy. It was even, according to our present manners, something like an infamous action. But at that period people did not manage affairs as they do to-day. Besides, D'Artagnan from her own admission knew Milady culpable of treachery at matters more important, and could entertain no respect for her. And yet, notwithstanding this want of respect, he felt an uncontrollable passion for this woman boiling in his veins, passion drunk with contempt, but passion or thirst, as the reader pleases. D'Artagnan's plan was very simple. 
by Kitty's chamber he could gain that of her mistress. He would take advantage of the first moment of surprise, shame, and terror to triumph over her. He might fail, but something must be left to chance. In eight days the campaign would open, and he would be compelled to leave Paris. D'Artagnan had no time for a prolonged love-siege. "'There,' said the young man, handing Kitty the letter sealed, "'give that to Milady. It is the Count's reply.' Poor Kitty became as pale as death. She suspected what the letter contained. "'Listen, my dear girl,' said D'Artagnan, "'you cannot but perceive that all this must end, some way or other. Milady may discover that you gave the first billet to my lackey instead of to the Count's, that it is I who have opened the others which ought to have been opened by de Wardes. Milady will then turn you out of doors, and you know she is not the woman to limit her vengeance.' alas said kitty for whom have i exposed myself to all that for me i well know my sweet girl said d'artagnan but i am grateful i swear to you but what does this note contain milady will tell you ah you do not love me cried kitty and i am very wretched to this reproach there is always one response which deludes women D'Artagnan replied in such a manner that Kitty remained in her great delusion. Although she cried freely before deciding to transmit the letter to her mistress, she did at last so decide, which was all D'Artagnan wished. Finally he promised that he would leave her mistress's presence at an early hour that evening, and that when he left the mistress he would ascend with the maid. This promise completed poor Kitty's consolation. End of chapter Chapter Thirty Four of the Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Thirty Four. In which the equipment of Aramis and Porthos is treated of. Since the four friends had been each in search of his equipments, there had been no fixed meeting between them. They dined apart from one another, wherever they might happen to be, and rather where they could. Duty likewise on its part took a portion of that precious time which was gliding away so rapidly. Only they had agreed to meet once a week, about one o'clock, at the residence of Athos, seeing that he, in agreement with the vow he had formed, did not pass over the threshold of his door. This day of reunion was the same day as that on which Kitty came to find D'Artagnan. Soon as Kitty left him, D'Artagnan directed his steps toward the Rue Ferru. He found Athos and Aramis philosophizing. Aramis had some slight inclination to resume the cassock. Athos, according to his system, neither encouraged or dissuaded him. Athos believed that every one should be left to his own free will. He never gave advice but when it was asked, and even then he required to be asked twice. "'People in general,' he said, "'only ask advice not to follow it. Or if they do follow it, it is for the sake of having someone to blame for having given it.' Porthos arrived a minute after D'Artagnan. The four friends were reunited." The four countenances express four different feelings. That of Porthos, tranquillity. That of D'Artagnan, hope. That of Aramis, uneasiness. That of Athos, carelessness. At the end of a moment's conversation, in which Porthos hinted that a lady of elevated rank had condescended to relieve him from his embarrassment, Mousqueton entered. He came to request his master to return to his lodgings, where his presence was urgent, as he piteously said, "'Is it my equipment?' "'Yes and no,' replied Mousqueton. "'Well, but can't you speak?' "'Come, monsieur.' Porthos rose, saluted his friends, and followed Mousqueton. An instant after, Bazin made his appearance at the door. "'What do you want with me, my friend?' said Aramis, with that 
mildness of language which was very observable in him every time that his ideas were directed toward the church. "'A man wishes to see Monsieur at home,' replied Bazin. "'A man? What man?' "'A mendicant.' "'Give him alms, Bazin, and bid him pray for a poor sinner. "'This mendicant insists upon speaking to you, "'and pretends that you will be very glad to see him.' "'Has he sent no particular message for me?' "'Yes, if Monsieur Aramis hesitates to come,' he said, "'tell him I am from Tours.' "'From Tours!' cried Aramis. "'A thousand pardons, gentlemen!' but no doubt this man brings me the news I expected. In rising also, he went off at a quick pace. There remained Athos and D'Artagnan. "'I believe these fellows have managed their business. What do you think, D'Artagnan?' said Athos. "'I know that Porthos was in a fair way,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And as to Aramis, to tell you the truth, I have never been seriously uneasy on his account. But you, my dear Athos, you who so generously distributed the Englishman's pistoles, which were our legitimate property, what do you mean to do? I am satisfied with having killed that fellow, my boy, seeing that it is blessed bread to kill an Englishman. But if I had pocketed his pistoles, they would have weighed me down like a remorse. Go to, my dear Athos, you have truly inconceivable ideas. Let it pass. What do you think of Monsieur de Treville telling me, when he did me the honour to call upon me yesterday, that you associated with the suspected English whom the Cardinal protects? That is to say, I visit an English woman, the one I named. Oh, I, the fair woman on whose account I gave you advice, which, naturally, you took care not to adopt. I gave you my reasons— "'Yes, you look there for your outfit, I think you said.' "'Not at all. I have acquired certain knowledge that that woman was concerned in the abduction of Madame Bonacieux.' "'Yes, I understand now. To find one woman, you court another. It is the longest road, but certainly the most amusing.' D'Artagnan was on the point of telling Athos all, but one consideration restrained him. Athos was a gentleman, punctilious in points of honour, and there were, in the plan which our lover had devised for Milady, he was sure, certain things that would not obtain the assent of this Puritan. He was therefore silent, and as Athos was the least inquisitive of any man on earth, D'Artagnan's confidence stopped there. We will therefore leave the two friends, who had nothing important to say to each other, and follow Aramis. Upon being informed that the person who wanted to speak to him came from Tours, we have seen with what rapidity the young man followed, or rather went before, Bazin. He ran without stopping from the Rue Ferru to the Rue de Vaugirard. On entering he found a man of short stature and intelligent eyes, but covered with rags. "'You have asked for me?' said the musketeer. "'I wish to speak with Monsieur Aramis. Is that your name, monsieur?' my very own. You have brought me something? Yes, if you show me a certain embroidered handkerchief. Here it is, said Aramis, taking a small key from his breast and opening a little ebony box inlaid with mother-of-pearl. Here it is. Look. That is right, replied the mendicant. Dismiss your lackey. In fact, Bazin, curious to know what the mendicant could want with his master, kept pace with him as well as he could, and arrived almost at the same time he did. But his quickness was not of much use to him. At the hint from the mendicant his master made him a sign to retire, and he was obliged to obey. Bazin gone, the mendicant cast a rapid glance around him in order to be sure that nobody could either see or hear him, and opening his ragged vest, badly held together by a leather strap, he began to rip the upper part of his doublet, from which he drew a letter. Aramis uttered a cry of joy at the sight of the seal, kissed the superscription with an almost religious respect, and opened the epistle, which contained what follows. My friend, 
it is the will of fate that we should be still for some time separated. But the delightful days of youth are not lost beyond return. Perform your duty in camp. I will do mine elsewhere. Accept that which the bearer brings you. Make the campaign like a handsome, true gentleman. And think of me, who kisses tenderly your black eyes. Adieu, or rather, au revoir. The mendicant continued to rip his garments, and drew from amid his rags a hundred and fifty Spanish double pistoles, which he laid down on the table. Then he opened the door, bowed, and went out before the young man, stupefied by his letter, had ventured to address a word to him. Aramis then reperused the letter and perceived a postscript. P.S. You may behave politely to the bearer, who is a count and a grandee of Spain. "'Golden dreams!' cried Aramis. "'Oh, beautiful life! Yes, we are young. Yes, we shall yet have happy days. My love, my blood, my life, all, all, all are thine, my adored mistress!' And he kissed the letter with passion, without even vouchsafing a look at the gold which sparkled on the table. Bazin scratched at the door, and as Aramis had no longer any reason to exclude him, he bade him come in. Bazin was stupefied at the sight of the gold, and forgot that he came to announce D'Artagnan, who, curious to know who the mendicant could be, came to Aramis on leaving Athos. Now, as D'Artagnan used no ceremony with Aramis, seeing that Bazin forgot to announce him, he announced himself. "'The devil, my dear Aramis,' said D'Artagnan, "'if these are the prunes that are sent to you from Tours, I beg you will make my compliments to the gardener who gathers them.' "'You are mistaken, friend D'Artagnan,' said Aramis, always on his guard. "'This is from my publisher, who has just sent me the price of that poem in one-syllable verse which I began yonder.' "'Ah, indeed,' said D'Artagnan. "'Well,' your publisher is very generous my dear aramis that's all i can say how monsieur cried bazin a poem sells so dear as that it is incredible oh monsieur you can write as much as you like you may become equal to monsieur de voiture and monsieur de Bensarade. i like that a poet is as good as an abbe ah monsieur aramis become a poet i beg of you Bazin, my friend, said Aramis, I believe you meddle with my conversation. Bazin perceived he was wrong. He bowed and went out. Ah, said D'Artagnan, with a smile, you sell your productions at their weight in gold. You are very fortunate, my friend, but take care, or you will lose that letter which is peeping from your doublet and which also comes, no doubt, from your publisher. Aramis blushed to the eyes, crammed in the letter, and rebuttoned his doublet. "'My dear D'Artagnan,' said he, "'if you please, we will join our friends. As I am rich, we will to-day begin to dine together again, expecting that you will be rich in your turn.' "'My faith!' said D'Artagnan with great pleasure. It is long since we have had a good dinner, and I, for my part, have a somewhat hazardous expedition for this evening, and shall not be sorry, I confess, to fortify myself with a few glasses of good old Burgundy. Agreed as to the old Burgundy, I have no objection to that, said Aramis, from whom the letter and the gold had removed, as by magic, his ideas of conversion and having put three or four double pistoles into his pocket to answer the needs of the moment, he placed the others in the ebony box, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, in which was the famous handkerchief which served him as a talisman. The two friends repaired to Athos's, and he, faithful to his vow of not going out, took upon him to order dinner to be brought to them. As he was perfectly acquainted with the details of gastronomy, D'Artagnan and Aramis made no objection to abandoning this important care to him. They went to find Porthos, and at the corner of the Rue Bac met Mousqueton, who, with a most pitiable air, was driving before him a mule and a horse. 
D'Artagnan uttered a cry of surprise, which was not quite free from joy. "'Ah! My yellow horse!' cried he. "'Aramis, look at that horse!' "'Oh, the frightful brute!' said Aramis. "'Ah, my dear!' replied D'Artagnan. "'Upon that very horse I came to Paris!' "'What? Does monsieur know this horse?' said Mousqueton. "'It is of an original colour," said Aramis. "'I never saw one with such a hide in my life.' "'I can well believe it,' replied D'Artagnan, "'and that was why I got three crowns for him. It must have been for his hide, for, certes, the carcass is not worth eighteen livres. But how did this horse come into your hands, Mousqueton?' "'Pray,' said the lackey, "'say nothing about it, monsieur. It is a frightful trick of the husband of our duchess. How is that, Mousqueton? Why, we are looked upon with a rather favourable eye by a lady of quality, the Duchesse de... Uh, mm, but your pardon, my master has commanded me to be discreet. She had forced us to accept a little souvenir, a magnificent Spanish genet and an Andalusian mule, which were beautiful to look upon. The husband heard of the affair. On their way he confiscated the two magnificent beasts which were being sent to us, and substituted these horrible animals. "'Which you are taking back to him?' said D'Artagnan. "'Exactly,' replied Mousqueton. "'You may well believe that we will not accept such steeds as these in exchange for those which have been promised to us.' "'No, pardieu, though I should like to have seen Porthos on my yellow horse. That would give me an idea of how I looked when I arrived in Paris. But don't let us hinder you, Mousqueton. Go and perform your master's orders. Is he at home?' "'Yes, monsieur,' said Mousqueton, but in a very ill humour. "'Get up!' He continued his way toward the Quai des Grands Augustins, while the two friends went to ring at the bell of the unfortunate Porthos. He, having seen them crossing the yard, took care not to answer, and they rang in vain. Meanwhile Mousqueton continued on his way, and crossing the Pont Neuf, still driving the two sorry animals before him, he reached the Rue aux Ors. Arrived there, he fastened, according to the orders of his master, both horse and mule to the knocker of the procurator's door. Then, without taking any thought for their future, he returned to Porthos, and told him that his commission was completed. In a short time the two unfortunate beasts, who had not eaten anything since the morning, made such a noise in raising and letting fall the knocker that the procurator ordered his errand-boy to go and inquire in the neighbourhood to whom this horse and mule belonged. Madame Coquenard recognised her present, and could not at first comprehend this restitution, but the visit of Porthos soon enlightened her. The anger which fired the eyes of the musketeer, in spite of his efforts to suppress it, terrified his sensitive inamorata. In fact, Mousqueton had not concealed from his master that he had met D'Artagnan and Aramis, and that D'Artagnan in the yellow horse had recognized the baronet's pony upon which he had come to Paris, and which he had sold for three crowns. Porthos went away, after having appointed a meeting with the procurator's wife in the cloister of saint Magloire. The procurator, seeing he was going, invited him to dinner, an invitation which the musketeer refused with a majestic air. Madame Coquenard repaired trembling to the cloister of saint Magloire, for she guessed the reproaches that awaited her there, but she was fascinated by the lofty airs of Porthos. All that which a man wounded in his self-love could let fall, in the shape of imprecations and reproaches, upon the head of a woman, Porthos let fall upon the bowed head of the procurator's wife. "'Alas!' said she, "'I did all for the best. One of our clients is a horse-dealer. He owes money to the office and is backward in his pay.' I took the mule and the horse for what he owed us. He assured me that they were two noble steeds. "'Well, madame,' said Porthos, "'if he owed you more than five crowns, your horse-dealer is a thief.' 
there is no harm in trying to buy things cheap monsieur porthos said the procurator's wife seeking to excuse herself no madame but they who so assiduously try to buy things cheap ought to permit others to seek more generous friends and porthos turning on his heel made a step to retire monsieur porthos monsieur porthos cried the procurator's wife i have been wrong i see it i ought not to have driven a bargain when it was to equip a cavalier like you porthos without reply retreated a second step the procurator's wife fancied she saw him in a brilliant cloud all surrounded by duchesses and marchionesses who cast bags of money at his feet stop in the name of heaven monsieur porthos cried she stop and let us talk talking with you brings me misfortune said porthos but tell me what do you ask nothing for that amounts to the same thing as if i asked you for something the procurator's wife hung upon the arm of porthos and in the violence of her grief she cried out monsieur porthos i am ignorant of all such matters how should i know what a horse is how should i know what horse furniture is you should have left it to me then madame who know what they are but you wish to be frugal and consequently to lend at usury it was wrong monsieur porthos but i will repair that wrong upon my word of honour how so asked the musketeer listen this evening monsieur coquenard is going to the house of the duc de chalne who has sent for him it is for a consultation which will last three hours at least come we shall be alone and can make up our accounts in good time now you talk my dear you pardon me we shall see said porthos majestically and the two separated saying till this evening the devil thought porthos as he walked away it appears i am getting nearer to monsieur coquenard's strong-box at last end of chapter Chapter Thirty Five of the Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Thirty Five A Gascon, a Match for Cupid. The evening so impatiently waited for by Porthos and by D'Artagnan at last arrived. As was his custom, D'Artagnan presented himself at Milady's at about nine o'clock. He found her in a charming humour. Never had he been so well received. Our Gascon knew, by the first glance of his eye, that his billet had been delivered and that this billet had had its effect. Kitty entered to bring some sherbet. Her mistress put on a charming face, and smiled on her graciously. But, alas, the poor girl was so sad that she did not even notice Milady's condescension. D'Artagnan looked at the two women, one after the other, and was forced to acknowledge that, in his opinion, Dame Nature had made a mistake in their formation. To the great lady she had given a heart vile and venal, to the soubrette she had given the heart of a duchess. At ten o'clock Milady began to appear restless. D'Artagnan knew what she wanted. She looked at the clock, rose, reseated herself, smiled at D'Artagnan with an air which said, "'You are very amiable, no doubt, but you would be charming if you would only depart.' D'Artagnan rose and took his hat. Milady gave him her hand to kiss. The young man felt her press his hand, and comprehended that this was a sentiment not of coquetry, but of gratitude because of his departure. "'She loves him devilishly,' he murmured. Then he went out. This time Kitty was nowhere waiting for him, neither in the antechamber, nor in the corridor, nor beneath the great door. It was necessary that D'Artagnan should find alone the staircase and the little chamber. She heard him enter, but she did not raise her head. The young man went to her and took her hands— then she sobbed aloud. 
as D'Artagnan had presumed, on receiving his letter, Milady, in a delirium of joy, had told her servant everything, and by way of recompense for the manner in which she had this time executed the commission, she had given Kitty a purse. Returning to her own room, Kitty had thrown the purse into a corner, where it lay open, disgorging three or four gold pieces on the carpet. The poor girl, under the caresses of D'Artagnan, lifted her head. D'Artagnan himself was frightened by the change in her countenance. She joined her hands with a suppliant air, but without venturing to speak a word. As little sensitive as was the heart of D'Artagnan, he was touched by this mute sorrow, but he held too tenaciously to his projects, above all to this one, to change the programme which he had laid out in advance. He did not therefore allow her any hope that he would flinch only he represented his action as one of simple vengeance. For the rest, this vengeance was very easy, for Milady, doubtless to conceal her blushes from her lover, had ordered Kitty to extinguish all the lights in the apartment, and even in the little chamber itself. Before daybreak, Monsieur de Ward must take his departure, still in obscurity. Presently they heard Milady retire to her room. D'Artagnan slipped into the wardrobe. Hardly was he concealed when the little bell sounded. Kitty went to her mistress, and did not leave the door open, but the partition was so thin that one could hear nearly all that passed between the two women. Milady seemed overcome with joy, and made Kitty repeat the smallest details of the pretended interview of the soubrette with de Ward when he received the letter, how he had responded, what was the expression of his face, if he seemed very amorous. And to all these questions poor Kitty, forced to put on a pleasant face, responded in a stifled voice whose dolorous accent her mistress did not, however, remark, solely because happiness is egotistical. Finally, as the hour for her interview with the Count approached, Milady had everything about her darkened, and ordered Kitty to return to her own chamber, and introduced de Ward whenever he presented himself. Kitty's detention was not long. Hardly had D'Artagnan seen, through a crevice in his closet, that the whole apartment was in obscurity, than he slipped out of his concealment at the very moment when Kitty reclosed the door of communication. "'What is that noise?' demanded Milady. "'It is I,' said D'Artagnan, in a subdued voice. "'I, the Comte de Ward.' "'Oh, my God, my God!' murmured Kitty. "'He has not even waited for the hour he himself named.' "'Well,' said Milady, in a trembling voice, "'why do you not enter? "'Count, Count,' added she, "'you know that I wait for you.' At this appeal, D'Artagnan drew Kitty quietly away, and slipped into the chamber. If rage or sorrow ever torture the heart, it is when a lover receives, under a name which is not his own, protestations of love addressed to his happy rival. D'Artagnan was in a dolorous situation which he had not foreseen. Jealousy gnawed his heart, and he suffered almost as much as poor Kitty, who at that very moment was crying in the next chamber. "'Yes, Count,' said Milady in her softest voice, and pressing his hand in her own, I am happy in the love which your looks and your words have expressed to me every time we have met. I also, I, love you. Oh, to-morrow, to-morrow I must have some pledge from you which will prove that you think of me, and that you may not forget me. Take this. And she slipped a ring from her finger onto D'Artagnan's. D'Artagnan remembered having seen this ring on the finger of Milady. It was a magnificent sapphire, encircled with brilliance. The first movement of D'Artagnan was to return it, but Milady added, "'No, no, keep that ring for love of me. Besides, in accepting it,' she added, in a voice full of emotion, "'you render me a much greater service than you imagine.' "'This woman is full of mysteries,' murmured D'Artagnan to himself. At that instant he felt himself ready to reveal all. He even opened his mouth to tell Milady who he was, 
and with what a revengeful purpose he had come. But she added, "'Poor angel, whom that monster of a Gascon barely failed to kill!' The monster was himself. "'Oh!' continued Milady, "'do your wounds still make you suffer?' "'Yes, much,' said D'Artagnan, who did not well know how to answer. "'Be tranquil,' murmured Milady. "'I will avenge you, and cruelly.' "'Peste!' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'The moment for confidences has not yet come.' It took some time for D'Artagnan to resume this little dialogue, but then all the ideas of vengeance which he had brought with him had completely vanished. This woman exercised over him an unaccountable power. He hated and adored her at the same time. He would not have believed that two sentiments so opposite could dwell in the same heart, and by their union constitute a passion so strange, and as it were, diabolical. Presently it sounded one o'clock. It was necessary to separate. D'Artagnan, at the moment of quitting Milady, felt only the liveliest regret at the parting, and as they addressed each other in a reciprocally passionate adieu, another interview was arranged for the following week. Poor Kitty hoped to speak a few words to D'Artagnan when he passed through her chamber, but Milady herself reconducted him through the darkness, and only quit him at the staircase. The next morning D'Artagnan ran to find Athos. He was engaged in an adventure so singular that he wished for counsel. He therefore told him all. "'Your milady, said he, "'appears to be an infamous creature, "'but not the less you have done wrong to deceive her. "'In one fashion or another you have a terrible enemy on your hands.' While thus speaking, Athos regarded with attention the sapphire set with diamonds which had taken, on D'Artagnan's finger, the place of the queen's ring, carefully kept in a casket. "'You notice my ring?' said the Gascon, proud to display so rich a gift in the eyes of his friends. "'Yes,' said Athos. "'It reminds me of a family jewel.' "'It is beautiful, is it not?' said D'Artagnan. "'Yes,' said Athos. "'Magnificent. I did not think two sapphires of such a fine water existed. Have you traded it for your diamond?' "'No. It is a gift from my beautiful Englishwoman, or rather Frenchwoman, for I am convinced she was born in France, though I have not questioned her. "'That ring comes from Milady, cried Athos, with a voice in which it was easy to detect strong emotion. "'Her very self. She gave it me last night. Here it is,' replied D'Artagnan, taking it from his finger. Athos examined it and became very pale. He tried it on his left hand. It fit his finger as if made for it. A shade of anger and vengeance passed across the usually calm brow of this gentleman. "'It is impossible it can be she,' said he. "'How could this ring come into the hands of Milady Cleric? And yet it is difficult to suppose such a resemblance should exist between two jewels.' "'Do you know this ring?' said D'Artagnan. "'I thought I did.' replied Athos, but no doubt I was mistaken. And he returned D'Artagnan the ring without, however, ceasing to look at it. "'Pray, D'Artagnan,' said Athos, after a minute, "'either take off that ring or turn the mounting inside. It recalls such cruel recollections that I shall have no head to converse with you. Don't ask me for counsel. Don't tell me you are perplexed what to do. But stop!' Let me look at that sapphire again. The one I mentioned to you had one of its faces scratched by accident. D'Artagnan took off the ring, giving it again to Athos. Athos started. Look, said he, is it not strange? And he pointed out to D'Artagnan the scratch he had remembered. But from whom did this ring come to you, Athos? From my mother, who inherited it from her mother. As I told you, it is an old family jewel. "'And you sold it?' asked D'Artagnan, hesitatingly. "'No,' replied Athos, with a singular smile. "'I gave it away in a night of love, as it has been given to you.' 
D'Artagnan became pensive in his turn. It appeared as if there were abysses in Milady's soul, whose depths were dark and unknown. He took back the ring, but put it in his pocket and not on his finger. "'D'Artagnan,' said Athos, taking his hand, "'you know I love you. If I had a son, I could not love him better. Take my advice. Renounce this woman. I do not know her, but a sort of intuition tells me she is a lost creature, and that there is something fatal about her. "'You are right,' said D'Artagnan. "'I will have done with her. I own that this woman terrifies me.' "'Shall you have the courage?' said Athos. "'I shall,' replied D'Artagnan, "'and instantly.' "'In truth, my young friend, you will act rightly,' said the gentleman, pressing the Gascon's hand with an affection almost paternal. "'And God grant that this woman, who has scarcely entered into your life, may not leave a terrible trace in it.' And Athos bowed to D'Artagnan like a man who wishes it understood, that he would not be sorry to be left alone with his thoughts." On reaching home, D'Artagnan found Kitty waiting for him. A month of fever could not have changed her more than this one night of sleeplessness and sorrow. She was sent by her mistress to the false de Wardes. Her mistress was mad with love, intoxicated with joy. She wished to know when her lover could meet her a second night, and poor Kitty, pale and trembling, awaited D'Artagnan's reply. The counsels of his friend, joined to the cries of his own heart, made him determine, now his pride was saved and his vengeance satisfied, not to see Milady again. As a reply, he wrote the following letter. Do not depend upon me, madame, for the next meeting. Since my convalescence I have so many affairs of this kind on my hands that I am forced to regulate them a little. When your turn comes, I shall have the honour to inform you of it. I kiss your hands, Comte de Ward. Not a word about the sapphire. Was the Gascon determined to keep it as a weapon against Milady, Or else, let us be frank, did he not reserve the sapphire as a last resource for his outfit? It would be wrong to judge the actions of one period from the point of view of another. That which would now be considered as disgraceful to a gentleman, was at that time quite a simple and natural affair, and the younger sons of the best families were frequently supported by their mistresses. D'Artagnan gave the open letter to Kitty, who at first was unable to comprehend it, but who became almost wild with joy on reading it a second time. She could scarcely believe in her happiness, and D'Artagnan was forced to renew with the living voice the assurances which he had written. And whatever might be, considering the violent character of Milady, the danger which the poor girl incurred in giving this billet to her mistress, she ran back to the Place Royale as fast as her legs could carry her. The heart of the best woman is pitiless toward the sorrows of a rival. Milady opened the letter with eagerness equal to Kitty's in bringing it, but at the first word she read, she became livid. She crushed the paper in her hand, and turned with flashing eyes upon Kitty, she cried, "'What is this letter?' "'The answer to Madame's,' replied Kitty, all in a tremble. "'Impossible!' cried Milady. "'It is impossible a gentleman could have written such a letter to a woman.' Then all at once, starting, she cried, "'My God, can he have—' And she stopped. She ground her teeth. She was of the colour of ashes. She tried to go toward the window for air, but she could only stretch forth her arms. Her legs failed her, and she sank into an armchair. Kitty, fearing she was ill, hastened toward her and was beginning to open her dress. But Milady started up, pushing her away. "'What do you want with me?' said she. "'And why do you place your hand on me?' Uh, "'I thought that Madame was ill, and I wished to bring her help.' responded the maid, frightened at the terrible expression which had come over her mistress's face. "'I faint? I? I? Do you take me for half a woman? When I am insulted, I do not faint. I avenge myself.' And she made a sign for Kitty to leave the room. End of chapter
Chapter Thirty Six of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Thirty Six Dream of Vengeance. That evening Milady gave orders that when Monsieur d'Artagnan came as usual, he should be immediately admitted, but he did not come. The next day Kitty went to see the young man again, and related to him all that had passed on the preceding evening. D'Artagnan smiled. This jealous anger of Milady was his revenge. That evening Milady was still more impatient than on the preceding evening. She renewed the order relative to the Gascon but as before she expected him in vain. The next morning, when Kitty presented herself at D'Artagnan's, she was no longer joyous and alert as on the two preceding days, but on the contrary sad as death. D'Artagnan asked the poor girl what was the matter with her, but she, as her only reply, drew a letter from her pocket and gave it to him. This letter was in Milady's handwriting, only this time it was addressed to M. d'Artagnan, and not to M. de Ward. He opened it and read as follows. M. d'Artagnan, it is wrong thus to neglect your friends, particularly at the moment you are about to leave them for so long a time. My brother-in-law and myself expected you yesterday, and the day before, but in vain. Will it be the same this evening? You are very grateful— Milady Cleric. That's all very simple, said D'Artagnan. I expected this letter. My credit rises by the fall of that of Comte de Ward. And will you go? asked Kitty. Listen to me, my dear girl, said the Gascon, who sought for an excuse in his own eyes for breaking the promise he had made Athos. You must understand it would be impolitic not to accept such a positive invitation. Milady, not seeing me come again, would not be able to understand what could cause the interruption of my visits, and might suspect something. Who could say how far the vengeance of such a woman would go? "'Oh, my God!' said Kitty. "'You know how to represent things in such a way that you are always in the right. You are going now to pay your court to her again, and if this time you succeed in pleasing her in your own name and with your own face, it will be much worse than before. Instinct made poor Kitty guess a part of what was to happen. D'Artagnan reassured her as well as he could, and promised to remain insensible to the seductions of Milady. He desired Kitty to tell her mistress that he could not be more grateful for her kindnesses than he was, and that he would be obedient to her orders. He did not dare to write, for fear of not being able— to such experienced eyes as those of Milady, to disguise his writing sufficiently. As nine o'clock sounded, D'Artagnan was at the Place Royale. It was evident that the servants who waited in the antechamber were warned, for as soon as D'Artagnan appeared, before even he had asked if Milady were visible, one of them ran to announce him. "'Show him in,' said Milady, in a quick tone, but so piercing that D'Artagnan heard her in the antechamber— he was introduced. "'I am at home to nobody,' said Milady. "'Observe, to nobody.' The servant went out. D'Artagnan cast an inquiring glance at Milady. She was pale, and looked fatigued, either from tears or want of sleep. The number of lights had been intentionally diminished, but the young woman could not conceal the traces of the fever which had devoured her for two days." D'Artagnan approached her with his usual gallantry. She then made an extraordinary effort to receive him, but never did a more distressed countenance give the lie to a more amiable smile. To the questions which D'Artagnan put concerning her health, she replied, "'Bad, very bad.' "'Then,' replied he, "'my visit is ill-timed. You, no doubt, stand in need of repose, and I will withdraw.' "'No,' No, said Milady. On the contrary, stay, Monsieur d'Artagnan. 
your agreeable company will divert me. Uh oh, thought D'Artagnan, she has never been so kind before. On guard! Milady assumed the most agreeable air possible, and conversed with more than her usual brilliancy. At the same time the fever, which for an instant abandoned her, returned to give luster to her eyes, color to her cheeks, and vermilion to her lips. D'Artagnan was again in the presence of the Circe, who had before surrounded him with her enchantments. His love, which he believed to be extinct but which was only asleep, awoke again in his heart. Milady smiled, and D'Artagnan felt that he could damn himself for that smile. There was a moment at which he felt something like remorse. By degrees Milady became more communicative. She asked D'Artagnan if he had a mistress. Alas, said D'Artagnan, with the most sentimental air he could assume, can you be cruel enough to put such a question to me? To me, who from the moment I saw you, have only breathed and sighed through you and for you? Milady smiled with a strange smile. Then you love me? said she. Have I any need to tell you so? Have you not perceived it? It may be. But you know the more hearts are worth the capture, the more difficult they are to be won. Oh, difficulties do not affright me, said D'Artagnan. I shrink before nothing but impossibilities. Nothing is impossible, replied Milady, to true love. Nothing, madame? Nothing, replied Milady. The devil, thought D'Artagnan, the note is changed. Is she going to fall in love with me, by chance, this fair inconstant? And will she be disposed to give me myself another sapphire like that which she gave me for de Ward? D'Artagnan rapidly drew his seat nearer to Milady's. "'Well, now,' she said, "'let us see what you would do to prove this love of which you speak.' "'All that could be required of me. Order, I am ready.' "'For everything?' "'For everything!' cried D'Artagnan, who knew beforehand that he had not much to risk in engaging himself thus. "'Well, now let us talk a little seriously,' said Milady, in her turn drawing her armchair nearer to D'Artagnan's chair. "'I am all attention, madame,' said he. Milady remained thoughtful and undecided for a moment. Then, as if appearing to have formed a resolution, she said— I have an enemy. You, madame, said D'Artagnan, affecting surprise. Is that possible, my God, good and beautiful as you are? A mortal enemy. Indeed. An enemy who has insulted me so cruelly that between him and me it is war to the death. May I reckon on you as an auxiliary? D'Artagnan at once perceived the ground which the vindictive creature wished to reach. "'You may, madame,' said he, with emphasis. "'My arm and my life belong to you, like my love.' "'Then,' said Milady, "'since you are as generous as you are loving—' She stopped. "'Well?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'Well,' replied Milady, after a moment of silence, from the present time, cease to talk of impossibilities. "'Do not overwhelm me with happiness!' cried D'Artagnan, throwing himself on his knees, and covering with kisses the hands abandoned to him. "'Avenge me of that infamous de Ward,' said Milady between her teeth, "'and I shall soon know how to get rid of you, you double idiot, you animated sword-blade!' fall voluntarily into my arms, hypocritical and dangerous woman," said D'Artagnan, likewise to himself, after having abused me with such effrontery, and afterward I will laugh at you with him whom you wish me to kill. D'Artagnan lifted up his head. "'I am ready,' said he. "'You have understood me, then, my dear Monsieur D'Artagnan,' said Milady. "'I could interpret one of your looks.' then you would employ for me your arm, which has already acquired so much renown? Instantly! But on my part, said Milady, 
how should I repay such a service? I know these lovers. They are men who do nothing for nothing. You know the only reply that I desire, said D'Artagnan, the only one worthy of you and of me. And he drew nearer to her. She scarcely resisted. Interested man, cried she, smiling. Ah! cried D'Artagnan, really carried away by the passion this woman had the power to kindle in his heart. Ah! that is because my happiness appears so impossible to me, and I have such fear that it should fly away from me like a dream that I pant to make a reality of it. Well, merit this pretended happiness, then. I am at your orders, said D'Artagnan. Quite certain, said Milady, with a last doubt. Only name to me the base man that has brought tears into your beautiful eyes. Who told you that I have been weeping? said she. It appeared to me, such women as I never weep, said Milady. So much the better. Come, tell me his name. Remember that his name is all my secret. Yet I must know his name. Yes, you must. See what confidence I have in you. You overwhelm me with joy. What is his name? You know him. Indeed. Yes. It is surely not one of my friends, replied D'Artagnan, affecting hesitation in order to make her believe him ignorant. If it were one of your friends you would hesitate, then? cried Milady, and a threatening glance darted from her eyes. Not if it were my own brother! cried D'Artagnan, as if carried away by his enthusiasm. Our Gascon promised this without risk, for he knew all that was meant. "'I love your devotedness,' said Milady. "'Alas, do you love nothing else in me?' asked D'Artagnan. "'I love you also, you,' said she, taking his hand. The warm pressure made D'Artagnan tremble, as if by the touch that fever which consumed Milady attacked himself. "'You love me, you!' cried he. "'Oh, if that were so, I should lose my reason!' And he folded her in his arms. She made no effort to remove her lips from his kisses, only she did not respond to them. Her lips were cold. It appeared to D'Artagnan that he had embraced a statue. He was not the less intoxicated with joy, electrified by love. He almost believed in the tenderness of Milady. He almost believed in the crime of De Ward. If De Ward had at that moment been under his hand, he would have killed him. Milady seized the occasion. "'His name is,' said she, in her turn. "'De Ward, I know it!' cried D'Artagnan. "'And how do you know it?' asked Milady, seizing both his hands and endeavouring to read with her eyes to the bottom of his heart. D'Artagnan felt he had allowed himself to be carried away, and that he had committed an error. "'Tell me, tell me, tell me, I say,' repeated Milady. "'How do you know it?' "'How do I know it?' said D'Artagnan. "'Yes.' "'I know it because yesterday Monsieur de Ward—' in a saloon where I was, showed a ring which he said he had received from you. Wretch! cried Milady. The epithet, as may be easily understood, resounded to the very bottom of D'Artagnan's heart. Well, continued she, well, I will avenge you of this wretch, replied D'Artagnan, giving himself the airs of Don Jafet of Armenia. Thanks, my brave friend, cried Milady, and when shall I be avenged? Tomorrow, immediately, when you please. Milady was about to cry out, immediately, but she reflected that such precipitation would not be very gracious toward D'Artagnan. Besides, she had a thousand precautions to take, a thousand counsels to give to her defender, in order that he might avoid explanations with the Count before witnesses. All this was answered by an expression of D'Artagnan's. "'Tomorrow,' said he, "'you will be avenged, or I shall be dead.' "'No,' said she, "'you will avenge me, but you will not be dead. He is a coward.' "'With women, perhaps, but not with men. I know something of him.'
but it seems you had not much reason to complain of your fortune in your contest with him. Fortune is a courtesan. Favourable yesterday, she may turn her back to-morrow. Which means that you now hesitate? No, I do not hesitate. God forbid! But would it be just to allow me to go to a possible death, without having given me at least something more than hope? The lady answered by a glance which said, Is that all? Speak then. And then accompanying the glance with explanatory words, That is but too just, said she tenderly. Oh, you are an angel, exclaimed the young man. Then all is agreed, said she, except that which I ask of you, dear love. But when I assure you that you may rely on my tenderness, I cannot wait till to-morrow. Silence! I hear my brother. It will be useless for him to find you here. She rang the bell, and Kitty appeared. Go out this way, said she, opening up a small private door, and come back at eleven o'clock. We will then terminate this conversation. Kitty will conduct you to my chamber. The poor girl almost fainted at hearing these words. "'Well, mademoiselle, what are you thinking about, standing there like a statue? Do as I bid you. Show the chevalier out, and this evening at eleven o'clock you have heard what I said.' "'It appears that these appointments are all made for eleven o'clock,' thought D'Artagnan. "'That's a settled custom.' Milady held out her hand to him, which he kissed tenderly. "'But,' said he, as he retired as quickly as possible from the reproaches of Kitty, I must not play the fool. This woman is certainly a great liar. I must take care. End of chapter Chapter 37 of The Three Musketeers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 37 Milady's Secret D'Artagnan left the hotel instead of going up at once to Kitty's chamber, as she endeavored to persuade him to do, and that for two reasons. The first, because by this means he should escape reproaches, recriminations, and prayers, the second, because he was not sorry to have an opportunity of reading his own thoughts, and endeavouring, if possible, to fathom those of this woman. What was most clear in the matter was that D'Artagnan loved Milady like a madman, and that she did not love him at all. In an instant D'Artagnan perceived that the best way in which he could act would be to go home and write Milady a long letter, in which he would confess to her that he and de Wardes were, up to the present moment, absolutely the same, and that consequently he could not undertake, without committing suicide, to kill the Comte de Ward. But he also was spurred on by a ferocious desire of vengeance. He wished to subdue this woman in his own name, and as this vengeance appeared to him to have a certain sweetness in it, he could not make up his mind to renounce it. He walked six or seven times round the Place Royale, turning it every ten steps to look at the light in Milady's apartment, which was to be seen through the blinds. It was evident that this time the young woman was not in such haste to retire to her apartment as she had been the first. At length the light disappeared. With this light was extinguished the last irresolution in the heart of D'Artagnan. He recalled to his mind the details of the first night, and with a beating heart and a brain on fire, he re-entered the hotel and flew toward Kitty's chamber. The poor girl, pale as death and trembling in all her limbs, wished to delay her lover, but Milady, with her ear on the watch, had heard the noise D'Artagnan had made, and opening the door said, "'Come in.' All this was of such incredible immodesty, of such monstrous effrontery, that D'Artagnan could scarcely believe what he saw or what he heard." He imagined himself to be drawn into one of those fantastic intrigues one meets in dreams. He, however, darted not the less quickly toward Milady, 
yielding to that magnetic attraction which the lodestone exercises over iron. As the door closed after them, Kitty rushed toward it. Jealousy, fury, offended pride, all the passions, in short, that dispute the heart of an outraged woman in love, urged her to make a revelation. But she reflected that she would be totally lost if she confessed having assisted in such a machination, and, above all, that D'Artagnan would also be lost to her for ever. This last thought of love counselled her to make this last sacrifice. D'Artagnan, on his part, had gained the summit of all his wishes. It was no longer a rival who was beloved, it was himself who was apparently beloved. A secret voice whispered to him, at the bottom of his heart, that he was but an instrument of vengeance, that he was only caressed till he had given death. But pride, but self-love, but madness silenced this voice and stifled its murmurs. And then our Gascon, with that large quantity of conceit which we know he possessed, compared himself with de Ward, and asked himself why, after all, he should not be beloved for himself. He was absorbed entirely by the sensations of the moment. The lady was no longer for him that woman of fatal intentions who had for a moment terrified him. She was an ardent, passionate mistress, abandoning herself to love which she also seemed to feel. Two hours thus glided away. When the transports of the two lovers were calmer, Milady, who had not the same motives for forgetfulness that D'Artagnan had, was the first to return to reality, and asked the young man if the means which were on the morrow to bring on the encounter between him and de Wardes were already arranged in his mind. But D'Artagnan, whose ideas had taken quite another course, forgot himself like a fool, and answered gallantly that it was too late to think about duels and sword-thrusts. This coldness toward the only interests that occupied her mind terrified Milady, whose questions became more pressing. Then D'Artagnan, who had never seriously thought of this impossible duel, endeavoured to turn the conversation. But he could not succeed. Milady kept him within the limits she had traced beforehand, with her irresistible spirit and her iron will. D'Artagnan fancied himself very cunning when advising Milady to renounce, by pardoning de Ward, the furious projects she had formed. But at the first word the young woman started, and exclaimed in a sharp, bantering tone, which sounded strangely in the darkness, "'Are you afraid, dear Monsieur d'Artagnan?' "'You cannot think so, dear love,' replied d'Artagnan. "'But now, suppose this poor Comte de Ward were less guilty than you think him.' "'At all events,' said Milady seriously, "'he has deceived me, and from the moment he deceived me, he merited death.' "'He shall die, then, since you condemn him,' said D'Artagnan, in so firm a tone that it appeared to Milady an undoubted proof of devotion. This reassured her. We cannot say how long the night seemed to Milady, but D'Artagnan believed it to be hardly two hours before the daylight peeped through the window-blinds, and invaded the chamber with its paleness. Seeing D'Artagnan about to leave her, Milady recalled his promise to avenge her on the Comte de Ward. "'I am quite ready,' said D'Artagnan. "'But in the first place I should like to be certain of one thing.' "'And what is that?' asked Milady. "'That is, whether you really love me.' "'I have given you proof of that, it seems to me.' "'And I am yours, body and soul.' "'Thanks, my brave lover. But as you are satisfied of my love, you must in your turn satisfy me of yours. Is it not so? Certainly. But if you love me as much as you say, replied D'Artagnan, do you not entertain a little fear on my account? What have I to fear? Why, that I might be dangerously wounded, killed even. Impossible, cried Milady. You are such a valiant man, and such an expert swordsman. You would not, then, prefer a method, resumed D'Artagnan, which would equally avenge you while rendering the combat useless? Milady looked at her lover in silence. 
the pale light of the first rays of day gave to her clear eyes a strangely frightful expression. "'Really,' said she, "'I believe you now begin to hesitate.' "'No, I do not hesitate, but I really pity this poor Comte de Ward, since you have ceased to love him. I think that a man must be so severely punished by the loss of your love that he stands in need of no other chastisement.' "'Who told you that I loved him?' asked Milady sharply. "'At least I am now at liberty to believe, without too much fatuity, that you love another,' said the young man in a caressing tone, "'and I repeat that I am really interested for the Count.' "'You?' asked Milady. "'Yes, I.' "'And why you?' "'Because I alone know—' "'What?' that he is far from being, or rather having been, so guilty toward you as he appears. Indeed, said Milady in an anxious tone, explain yourself, for I really cannot tell what you mean. And she looked at D'Artagnan, who embraced her tenderly, with eyes which seemed to burn themselves away. Yes, I am a man of honor, said D'Artagnan, determined to come to an end, and since your love is mine, and I am satisfied I possess it, for I do possess it, do I not? Entirely. Go on. Well, I feel as if transformed. A confession weighs on my mind. A confession? If I had the least doubt of your love, I would not make it. But you love me, my beautiful mistress, do you not? Without doubt. Then, if through excess of love I have rendered myself culpable toward you, you will pardon me? Perhaps. D'Artagnan tried with his sweetest smile to touch his lips to Milady's, but she evaded him. This confession, said she, growing paler, what is this confession? You gave De Ward a meeting on Thursday last in this very room, did you not? "'No, no, it is not true,' said Milady, in a tone of voice so firm, and with a countenance so unchanged, that if D'Artagnan had not been in such perfect possession of the fact, he would have doubted. "'Do not lie, my angel,' said D'Artagnan, smiling. "'That would be useless.' "'What do you mean? Speak, you kill me!' "'Be satisfied. You are not guilty toward me.' and I have already pardoned you. What next? What next? De Ward cannot boast of anything. How is that? You have told me yourself that that ring— That ring I have! The Comte de Ward of Thursday and the D'Artagnan of today are the same person. The imprudent young man expected a surprise mixed with shame, a slight storm which would resolve itself into tears, but he was strangely deceived, and his error was not of long duration. Pale and trembling, Milady repulsed D'Artagnan's attempted embrace by a violent blow on the chest as she sprang out of bed. It was almost broad daylight. D'Artagnan detained her by her nightdress of fine India linen to implore her pardon, but she, with a strong movement, tried to escape. Then the cambric was torn from her beautiful shoulders, and on one of those lovely shoulders, round and white, D'Artagnan recognized, with inexpressible astonishment, the fleur-de-lis, that indelible mark which the hand of the infamous executioner had imprinted. "'Great God!' cried D'Artagnan, losing his hold of her dress, and remaining mute, motionless, and frozen. But Milady felt herself denounced even by his terror— he had doubtless seen all. The young man now knew her secret, her terrible secret, the secret she concealed even from her maid with such care, the secret of which all the world was ignorant except himself. She turned upon him, no longer like a furious woman, but like a wounded panther. "'Ah, wretch!' cried she. "'You have basely betrayed me, and still more, you have my secret. You shall die!' and she flew to a little inlaid casket which stood upon the dressing-table, opened it with a feverish and trembling hand, drew from it a small poniard with a golden haft and a sharp thin blade, 
and then threw herself with a bound upon D'Artagnan. Although the young man was brave, as we know, he was terrified at that wild countenance, those terribly dilated pupils, those pale cheeks, and those bleeding lips. He recoiled to the other side of the room as he would have done from a serpent which was crawling toward him, and his sword coming in contact with his nervous hand, he drew it almost unconsciously from the scabbard. But without taking any heed of the sword, Milady endeavoured to get near enough to him to stab him, and did not stop till she felt the sharp point at her throat. She then tried to seize the sword with her hands, but D'Artagnan kept it free from her grasp, and presenting the point, sometimes at her eyes, sometimes at her breast, compelled her to glide behind the bedstead, while he aimed at making his retreat by the door which led to Kitty's apartment. Milady, during this time, continued to strike at him with horrible fury, screaming in a formidable way. As all this, however, bore some resemblance to a duel, D'Artagnan began to recover himself little by little. "'Well, beautiful lady, very well,' said he. "'But, pardieu, if you don't calm yourself, I will design a second fleur-de-lis upon one of those pretty cheeks.' "'Scoundrel! Infamous scoundrel!' howled Milady. But D'Artagnan, still keeping on the defensive, drew near to Kitty's door. She, in overturning the furniture in her efforts to get at him, he, in screening himself behind the furniture to keep out of her reach, Kitty opened the door. D'Artagnan, who had unceasingly manoeuvred to gain this point, was not at more than three paces from it. With one spring he flew from the chamber of Milady into that of the maid, and quick as lightning he slammed to the door, and placed all his weight upon it, while Kitty pushed the bolts. Then Milady attempted to tear down the door-case, with a strength apparently above that of a woman, but finding she could not accomplish this, she in her fury stabbed at the door with her poniard, the point of which repeatedly glittered through the wood. Every blow was accompanied with terrible imprecations. "'Quick, Kitty, quick!' said D'Artagnan, in a low voice, as soon as the bolts were fast. "'Let me get out of the hotel, for if we leave her time to turn round, she will have me killed by the servants.' "'But you can't go out so,' said Kitty. "'You are naked.' "'That's true,' said D'Artagnan, then first thinking of the costume he found himself in. "'That's true. But dress me as well as you are able. Only make haste. Think, my dear girl, it's life and death.' Kitty was but too well aware of that. In a turn of the hand she muffled him up in a flowered robe, a large hood, and a cloak. She gave him some slippers, in which he placed his naked feet, and then conducted him down the stairs. It was time. Milady had already rung her bell and roused the whole hotel. The porter was drawing the cord at the moment Milady cried from her window, "'Don't open!' The young man fled while she was still threatening him with an impotent gesture. The moment she lost sight of him, Milady tumbled fainting into her chamber. End of chapter Chapter 38 of The Three Musketeers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith. Of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter thirty eight. How, without incommoding himself, Athos procures his equipment. D'Artagnan was so completely bewildered that, without taking any heed of what might become of Kitty, he ran at full speed across half Paris, and did not stop till he came to Athos's door. The confusion of his mind, the terror which spurred him on, the cries of some of the patrol who started in pursuit of him, and the hooting of the people who, notwithstanding the early hour, were going to their work, only made him precipitate his course. He crossed the court, ran up the two flights to Athos's apartment, and knocked at the door enough to break it down. Grimaud came, rubbing his half-open eyes, to answer this noisy summons, and D'Artagnan sprang with such violence into the room as nearly to overturn the astonished lackey. In spite of his habitual silence, the poor lad this time found his speech. "'Hullo, there!' 
cried he. "'What do you want, you strumpet? What's your business here, you hussy?' D'Artagnan threw off his hood, and disengaged his hands from the fold of the cloak. At sight of the moustaches and the naked sword, the poor devil perceived he had to deal with a man. He then concluded it must be an assassin. "'Help! Murder! Help!' cried he. "'Hold your tongue, you stupid fellow!' said the young man. "'I am D'Artagnan. Don't you know me? Where is your master?' "'You, Monsieur D'Artagnan!' cried Grimaud. "'Impossible!' "'Grimaud,' said Athos, coming out of his apartment in a dressing-gown, "'Grimaud, I thought I heard you permitting yourself to speak.' "'Ah, monsieur, it is silence!' Grimaud contented himself with pointing D'Artagnan out to his master with his finger. Athos recognized his comrade, and, phlegmatic as he was, he burst into a laugh which was quite excused by the strange masquerade before his eyes, petticoats falling over his shoes, sleeves tucked up, and moustaches stiff with agitation. "'Don't laugh, my friend!' cried D'Artagnan. "'For heaven's sake, don't laugh, for upon my soul it is no laughing matter.' And he pronounced these words with such a solemn air, and with such a real appearance of terror, that Athos eagerly seized his hand, crying, "'Are you wounded, my friend? How pale you are!' "'No, but I have just met with a terrible adventure. Are you alone, Athos?' "'Parbleu! Whom do you expect to find with me at this hour?' "'Well, well!' and D'Artagnan rushed into Athos's chamber. "'Come, speak,' said the latter, closing the door and bolting it, that they might not be disturbed. "'Is the king dead? Have you killed the cardinal? You are quite upset. Come, come, tell me. I am dying with curiosity and uneasiness.' "'Athos,' said D'Artagnan, getting rid of his female garments and appearing in his shirt, "'prepare yourself to hear an incredible, an unheard-of story.' "'Well, but put on this dressing-gown first, said the musketeer to his friend. D'Artagnan donned the robe as quickly as he could, mistaking one sleeve for the other, so greatly was he still agitated. "'Well,' said Athos. "'Well,' replied D'Artagnan, bending his mouth to Athos's ear, and lowering his voice, "'Milady is marked with a fleur-de-lis upon her shoulder.' "'Ah!' cried the musketeer as if he had received a ball in his heart. "'Let us see,' said D'Artagnan. "'Are you sure that the other is dead?' "'The other,' said Athos, in so stifled a voice that D'Artagnan scarcely heard him. "'Yes, she of whom you told me one day at Amiens.' Athos uttered a groan, and let his head sink on his hands. "'This is a woman of twenty-six or twenty-eight years.' "'Fair,' said Athos, is she not? Very. Blue and clear eyes, of a strange brilliancy, with black eyelids and eyebrows? Yes. Tall, well made. She has lost a tooth next to the eye-tooth on the left. Yes. The fleur-de-lis is small, rosy in color, and looks as if efforts had been made to efface it by the application of poultices. Yes. But you say she is English. She is called Milady, but she may be French. Lord de Winter is only her brother-in-law. I will see her, D'Artagnan. Beware, Athos, beware. You tried to kill her. She is a woman to return you the like, and not to fail. She will not dare to say anything. That would be to denounce herself. She is capable of anything or everything. Did you ever see her furious? No, said Athos. A tigress, a panther! Ah, my dear Athos, I am greatly afraid I have drawn a terrible vengeance on both of us. D'Artagnan then related all, the mad passion of Milady and her menaces of death. You are right, and upon my soul I would give my life for a hare, said Athos. Fortunately, the day after tomorrow we leave Paris. We are going, according to all probability, to La Rochelle, and once gone. She will follow you to the end of the world, Athos, if she recognizes you. Let her, then, exhaust her vengeance on me alone. My dear friend, of what consequence is it if she kills me? said Athos. 
Do you, perchance, think I set any great store by life? There is something horribly mysterious under all this, Athos. This woman is one of the cardinal's spies, I am sure of that. In that case, take care. If the cardinal does not hold you in high admiration for the affair of London, he entertains a great hatred for you. But as, considering everything, he cannot accuse you openly, and as hatred must be satisfied, particularly when it's a cardinal's hatred, take care of yourself. If you go out, do not go out alone. When you eat, use every precaution. Mistrust everything, in short, even your own shadow. Fortunately, said D'Artagnan, all this will be only necessary till after tomorrow evening, for once with the army, we shall have, I hope, only men to dread. In the meantime, said Athos, I renounce my plan of seclusion, and wherever you go, I will go with you. You must return to the Rue des Fossoyeurs. I will accompany you. But however near it may be, replied D'Artagnan, I cannot go thither in this guise. That's true, said Athos, and he rang the bell. Grimaud entered. Athos made him a sign to go to D'Artagnan's residence and bring back some clothes. Grimaud replied by another sign that he understood perfectly and set off. All this will not advance your outfit, said Athos, for if I am not mistaken, you have left the best of your apparel with Milady, and she will certainly not have the politeness to return it to you. Fortunately, you have the sapphire. The jewel is yours, my dear Athos. Did you not tell me it was a family jewel? Yes. My grandfather gave two thousand crowns for it, as he once told me. It formed part of the nuptial present he made his wife, and it is magnificent. My mother gave it to me, and I, fool as I was, instead of keeping the ring as a holy relic, gave it to this wretch. Then, my friend, take back this ring, to which I see you attach much value. I take back the ring, after it has passed through the hands of that infamous creature? Never. That ring is defiled, D'Artagnan. Sell it, then. Sell a jewel which came from my mother. I vow I should consider it a profanation. Pledge it, then. You can borrow at least a thousand crowns on it. With that sum you can extricate yourself from your present difficulties, and when you are full of money again, you can redeem it, and take it back cleansed from its ancient stains, as it will have passed through the hands of usurers. Athos smiled. "'You are a capital companion, D'Artagnan,' said he. "'Your never-failing cheerfulness raises poor souls in affliction. "'Well, let us pledge the ring, but upon one condition. "'What? "'That there shall be five hundred crowns for you, and five hundred crowns for me. "'Don't dream it, Athos. "'I don't need the quarter of such a sum. "'I, who am still only in the guards, and by selling my saddles I shall procure it. What do I want? A horse for Planchet, that's all. Besides, you forget that I have a ring likewise. To which you attach more value, it seems, than I do to mine. At least, I have thought so. Yes, for in any extreme circumstance it might not only extricate us from some great embarrassment, but even a great danger. It is not only a valuable diamond, but it is an enchanted talisman. I don't at all understand you but I believe all you say to be true. Let us return to my ring, or, or rather to yours. You shall take half the sum that will be advanced upon it, or I will throw it into the Seine. And I doubt, as was the case with Polycrates, whether any fish will be sufficiently complacent to bring it back to us. Well, I will take it, then, said D'Artagnan. At this moment Grimaud returned, accompanied by Planchet. The latter, anxious about his master, and curious to know what had happened to him, had taken advantage of the opportunity and brought the garments himself. D'Artagnan dressed himself, and Athos did the same. When the two were ready to go out, the latter made Grimaud the sign of a man taking aim, and the lackey immediately took down his musketoon and prepared to follow his master. They arrived without accident at the Rue des Fossoyeurs. Bonacieux was standing at the door, and looked at D'Artagnan hatefully. 
"'Make haste, dear lodger,' said he. "'There is a very pretty girl waiting for you upstairs, "'and you know women don't like to be kept waiting.' "'That's Kitty,' said D'Artagnan to himself, "'and he darted into the passage. "'Sure enough, upon the landing leading to the chamber, "'and crouching against the door, "'he found the poor girl all in a tremble. "'As soon as she perceived him, she cried, you have promised your protection you have promised to save me from her anger remember it is you who have ruined me yes yes to be sure kitty said d'artagnan be at ease my girl but what happened after my departure how can i tell said kitty the lackeys were brought by the cries she made she was mad with passion there exists no imprecation she did not pour out against you then I thought she would remember it was through my chamber you had penetrated hers, and that then she would suppose I was your accomplice. So I took what little money I had, and the best of my things, and I got away. Poor dear girl! But what can I do with you? I am going away the day after tomorrow. Do what you please, Monsieur Chevalier. Help me out of Paris. Help me out of France. I cannot take you, however, to the siege of La Rochelle said d'artagnan no but you can place me in one of the provinces with some lady of your acquaintance in your own country for instance my dear little love in my country the ladies do without chambermaids but stop i can manage your business for you planchet go and find aramis request him to come here directly we have something very important to say to him i understand said athos but why not Porthos? I should have thought that his duchess— Oh, Porthos's duchess is dressed by her husband's clerks, said D'Artagnan, laughing. Besides, Kitty would not like to live in the Rue d'Ozor. Isn't it so, Kitty? I do not care where I live, said Kitty, provided I am well concealed, and nobody knows where I am. Meanwhile, Kitty, when we are about to separate, and you are no longer jealous of me— monsieur chevalier far off or near said kitty i shall always love you where the devil will constancy niche itself next murmured athos and i also said d'artagnan i also i shall always love you be sure of that but now answer me i attach great importance to the question i am about to put to you did you never hear talk of a young woman who was carried off one night. There now, oh, Monsieur Chevalier, do you love that woman still? No, no, it is one of my friends who loves her. Monsieur Athos, this gentleman here. I, cried Athos, with an accent like that of a man who perceives he is about to tread upon an adder. You, to be sure, said D'Artagnan, pressing Athos's hand. You know the interest we both take in this poor little Madame Bonacieux. Besides, Kitty will tell nothing. Will you, Kitty? You understand, my dear girl, continued D'Artagnan. She is the wife of that frightful baboon you saw at the door as you came in. Oh, my God! You remind me of my fright. If he should have known me again! How? Know you again? Did you ever see that man before? He came twice to Milady's. That's it. About what time? Why, about fifteen or eighteen days ago. Exactly so. And yesterday evening he came again. Yesterday evening? Yes, just before you came. My dear Athos, we are enveloped in a network of spies. And do you believe he knew you again, Kitty? I pulled down my hood as soon as I saw him. But perhaps it was too late. Go down, Athos. He mistrusts you less than me, and see if he be still at his door. Athos went down and returned immediately. He is gone, said he, and the house door is shut. He is gone to make his report, and to say that all the pigeons are at this moment in the dovecote. Well, then, let us all fly, said Athos, and leave nobody here but Planchet to bring us news. A minute. Aramis, whom we have sent for. That's true, said Athos. We must wait for Aramis. At that moment, 
Aramis entered. The matter was all explained to him, and the friends gave him to understand that among all his high connections he must find a place for Kitty. Aramis reflected for a minute, and then said, colouring, "'Will it be fully rendering you a service, D'Artagnan?' "'I shall be grateful to you all my life.' "'Very well. Madame de Boitrecy asked me, for one of her friends who resides in the provinces, I believe, for a trustworthy maid. If you can, my dear D'Artagnan, answer for Mademoiselle—' "'Oh, monsieur, be assured that I shall be entirely devoted to the person who will give me the means of quitting Paris.' "'Then,' said Aramis, "'this falls out very well.' He placed himself at the table and wrote a little note which he sealed with a ring, and gave the billet to Kitty. "'And now, my dear girl,' said D'Artagnan, "'you know that it is not good for any of us to be here. Therefore let us separate. We shall meet again in better days.' "'And whenever we find each other, in whatever place it may be,' said Kitty, "'you will find me loving you as I love you to-day.' "'Dicer's oaths!' said Athos, while D'Artagnan went to conduct Kitty downstairs. An instant afterward the three young men separated, agreeing to meet again at four o'clock with Athos, and leaving Planchet to guard the house. Aramis returned home, and Athos and D'Artagnan busied themselves about pledging the sapphire. As the Gascon had foreseen, they easily obtained three hundred pistoles on the ring. Still further, the Jew told them that if they would sell it to him, as it would make a magnificent pendant for earrings, he would give five hundred pistoles for it. Athos and D'Artagnan, with the activity of two soldiers and the knowledge of two connoisseurs, hardly required three hours to purchase the entire equipment of the musketeer. Besides, Athos was very easy, and a noble to his fingers' ends. When a thing suited him he paid the price demanded, without thinking to ask for any abatement. D'Artagnan would have remonstrated at this, but Athos put his hand upon his shoulder with a smile, and D'Artagnan understood that it was all very well for such a little Gascon gentleman as himself to drive a bargain, but not for a man who had the bearing of a prince. The musketeer met with a superb Andalusian horse, black as jet, nostrils of fire, legs clean and elegant, rising six years. He examined him, and found him sound and without blemish. They asked a thousand livres for him. He might perhaps have been bought for less, but while D'Artagnan was discussing the price with the dealer, Athos was counting out the money on the table. Grimaud had a stout, short Picard cob, which cost three hundred livres. But when the saddle and arms for Grimaud were purchased, Athos had not a sou left of his hundred and fifty pistoles. D'Artagnan offered his friend a part of his share, which he should return when convenient. But Athos only replied to this proposal by shrugging his shoulders. "'How much did the Jew say he would give for the sapphire if he purchased it?' said Athos. Five hundred pistoles?' "'That is to say, two hundred more. A hundred pistoles for you, and a hundred pistoles for me. Well, now, that would be a real fortune to us, my friend.' let us go back to the Jews again. What, will you? This ring would certainly only recall very bitter remembrances. Then we shall never be masters of three hundred pistoles to redeem it, so that we really should lose two hundred pistoles by the bargain. Go and tell him the ring is his, D'Artagnan, and bring back the two hundred pistoles with you. Reflect, Athos. Ready money is needful for the present time and we must learn how to make sacrifices. Go, D'Artagnan, go. Grimaud will accompany you with his musketoon. A half hour afterward, D'Artagnan returned with the two thousand livres, and without having met with any accident. It was thus Athos found at home resources which he did not expect. End of chapter